Behind me is the knoll of WF16, the location of the pre-pottery near Thigay site. It looks just like a knoll, a bit of the geology of the landscape, but in fact the upper parts of it is a Neolithic tell. It's the compacted collapse of mud clay buildings that accumulated over several thousand years. Steve and I found this site on the back of some survey I was doing for the Nature Reserve, the Baseline Cultural Heritage Survey. And in 1996 we came here looking for early prehistory. And we walked around the wadi hunting for different sites uh, in very hot weather until finally one day we started walking up the knoll that you see behind us where we found a whole series of flint artefacts, little flint blades, very fine pieces of well-crafted well flint, and grinding stones, typical of the early Neolithic, with cup holes in them, where they used to use a pestle and mortar to work nuts and grain and so on. That gave us an indication that we had what's, what at that point was incredibly rare, a very early Neolithic site in Jordan. There'd only been one found before in Jordan at that time, so this was a very interesting opportunity for us to come back and do more work. We came back and did several years worth of evaluation, doing more survey in the area and digging a number of small trenches. And we found very interesting results. First of all was the architecture, where we had a range of different types of building. From the, the front of the knoll we had what we thought was the very earliest architecture, typical of what the previous hunter-gatherers had been living in, where there was a pit dug into the ground, roughly lined with boulders, um, but not a proper wall, and just a little bit of mud used to mortar the holes between the boulders. Then we found, above that, we found uh, mud-built buildings, buildings made out of adobe or pise, um, where the walls were made out of layers and layers of, of, of thick, very strong mud that dried almost like concrete. And then finally, the last phase on the site seems to be when they came out of these semi-subterranean buildings and started to build above ground with stone architecture, coarse stone, so that the walls were actually going up above ground level. So that was very interesting, seeing that sequence of architectural development. But we also had a, a whole range of artefacts that we found, and, and, and various bits of economic evidence, particularly the animal bones, which showed that one of the specialities of the site was hunting wild goats, which was particularly interesting to us because that's one of the key animals at the beginning of the process of domestication. When we opened the large trench in 2008, we immediately went down onto a complex array of walls built out of mud clay. These turned out to be the walls of a dense cluster of structures, mainly circular structures, that had been cut into the underlying uh, gravel terrace, lined with pise, this mud clay, and then had walls built up perhaps a metre, maybe two metres above the surface to make semi subterranean structures. Then they had what we think were flat roofs on. There's a whole mix of these. Some very small ones that we know had been used as workshops because of the artefacts we found in them. Others we think were used for storage. Some probably as domestic dwellings for a range of uh, plant processing, cooking activities. And others, uh, one particular large one, was a very large communal structure. But there was one structure in particular that was important because well preserved, because sometime in prehistory it actually burnt down, which, which enabled much better preservation than any of the others. And we're actually sitting on a replica of the roof of that structure because as it burnt down, it took down the whole roof with it and baked it hard so we know how the roof was actually made, which is a very unusual uh, feature to get on a Neolithic excavation. So you can see how it's made. It's basically made of mud mixed with uh, chaff from barley and uh, some, some gravel and clay. And it's like concrete. These buildings are very solid, which is how they've been preserved for the last uh, 12,000 years. The building that burnt down, um, very interesting building, it consists of a number of different phases, but the best and most interesting uh, phase is one where it seems to be used as a storage chamber. There's a cell inside it, which is made of, of a fairly thin mud clay wrapped around what we think was some wicker work to make a, 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 a little domed central uh, container. And underneath that, there were a number of small divisions in the mud clay, so it was partitioned inside. Around that, inside the, the rest of the building, were a series of uh, stones placed so that you could actually put wooden posts in between them, wooden uh, beams in between them, and on that was a floor. So there was a floor lifted up above the ground, so you had a suspended floor. And we think the purpose of these things was for storage, so that you're containing it and you're lifting it up out of any soil moisture, away from any of the rodents and mice and things that are beginning to live with people. Uh, and the only reason we can really see for that is so that you, you're, you're actually preserving the, the material and things that you're harvesting at the site. That, that was a remarkable find, that, that structure. 
But possibly even more amazing was what we discovered at the far northern end of the settlement. When we had removed all the, the, the top deposits, we came down to a very large area of midden. Now, midden is a rubbish dump. It's archaeological gold dust. And it was within that that we found a huge array of discarded animal bone fragments, the debris for making stone tools and beads, and so forth. That was brilliant. But as we excavated further down, we came onto a solid mud plaster fall below that. And when you removed all the midden, that turned out to be a huge structure, the largest we had ever seen in this part of the Levant, indeed one of the largest ever found in the Neolithic. This, this turned out to be a structure of uh, about 20 metres in, in diameter. Uh, it was surrounded by benches, wide benches, on which people could have sat or even, or even laid or, or, or slept. And it seems to have been a uh, structure not only built by a large corporation of probably several families, but probably for communal activities. Because it almost looks like a small amphitheatre, and it's impossible to get away from the idea that this was some, for some sort of performance. Now, whether ritual or simply entertainment, whether it was about social rituals, we're not clear. But it's a remarkable discovery at this, this site, showing that no doubt this was an area where people came from uh, the rounding landscape to aggregate here, probably at certain times of the year, for important rituals about maintaining the solid solidarity of the Neolithic wider community. One of the possibilities is it's to do with harvesting, when they need to bring people together for the labour. And at one end of this elliptical building, on little platforms raised up inside the floor of the structure, are two of the grinding stones. So we do wonder whether it's a, a place where you could almost have some sort of harvest festival, if that's not too fanciful an idea, where you're bringing together people for a, a harvest party, which brings you the labour force you need for this new activity uh, and explains why you've got this construction. It's also, it's the only building we've got in, the, in this part of the, the, the Levant which is decorated, preserved on the faces of the, the plaster walls are, are, are wavy lines of mud, um, forming a, 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 a double wave pattern. And there are other, other features like bosses and so on, and it looks like it's replastered repeatedly, so they're probably redecorating it, perhaps even for each time they use it, uh, by another thin coating of plaster on top. One of the most fascinating aspects of the excavation were the human burials that we found on the site. Now these had been cut into floors and walls of the structures. Uh, people, the dead, had been placed into these in, in a crouched position, often in a sleeping position with a head on their hands. They were both of adults and children and some infants. We suspect a cross-section of the whole community that were there. Now sometimes they've been placed into the burial and just left there as what we call a primary burial. In other cases, it seems that part of the uh, skeleton had been removed and placed elsewhere. So, for instance, we find some skeletons where we have multiple skulls there, or ones with no skulls at all, ones where they just put the torso left. So it seems there was a the, the, the complex burial process, burial ritual, that probably went on for many years as the dead were moved from location to location. Some graves opened again and further bones put in, possibly of relations, and then closed again. And some of the skulls we found had been decorated, decorated with bands of black uh, paint uh, around the back of them. And in some cases, bones had been wrapped up in gypsum plaster bundles. Uh, looks like they were then wrapped in some vegetable fibres because of the imprints that on the fibre. So a complex uh, burial process ritual occurring at the site, showing that WF16 is not only a place of the living, it's also a place of the dead. The burial practices start from the very beginning of the site, so we've got some below the floors of the earliest buildings, we've got real foundation burials, where the heads were left, or the skulls were left, sticking slightly through the floor to mark their positions, so that people could open them up later on. But the majority of the burials we've got are quite high in the, in the site's history, and reflect a layer that, of architecture that we've probably lost. It's probably eroded off the top of the knoll, and, and all we've got left is, is the burials and some of the ground stones, except for one building, one very large circular structure that was preserved because it was put partly inside the hollow where the, the amphitheatre structure used to be. And that's a very substantial building, and what's interesting about it is that it's actually no longer a semi-subterranean building, it's a freestanding building with the walls going above ground, the big change in architecture that happens towards the end of this pre-Potinolithic A period.
Interestingly, the midden that we found covering the, the large structure, the large communal structure, probably relates to this final phase, and perhaps even to that building. It's where people have been throwing out vast quantities of animal bone, and also a large number of broken artefacts, objects, and art objects and tools and so on. And because we've got that midden, we've actually got a remarkable collection of objects which haven't been found at many other PP PPNA sites, including a lot of the, the broken bits of decorate, decorated items, figurines and so on. Well, one element of the animal fauna I find particularly fascinating are the bird bones. Wadi Fanan is a wonderful place for bird watching and, and particularly striking the, the, the raptors, the eagles and the vultures we see. When we excavated WF16 we found a huge number of bird bones there. Uh, in, one, one, in one structure, the one in which this reconstruction is based, we found a horizon where there must have been eight or nine complete um, skeletons of what we think were buzzards. Uh, now, what we think is that they had either been um, full um, stuffed birds, perhaps, that had been um, around on the walls or maybe hanging from the, um, from the uh, roof of the house there, showing that the relationships with the animals and plants were not only of an economic nature, but of a social and symbolic nature as well. What's really interesting are the goat bone remains, um, because what, what we've been discovering with that, uh, work, working with a colleague, is that the pattern of, of animals that's killed does not represent what you would get if you were just killing the animals at random, or even following uh, typical hunting patterns. They seem to be trying to cull the animals in a particular way, so that they're killing particular age groups and particular sexes of animals to control the structure of the herd. It's not quite the same pattern as you get later on when people are moving into a sort of proto-domesticated form of, of, of herd, herd structuring, but it shows that they're beginning to develop the skills to actually control control the, the wild animal herds around them and their breeding patterns uh, so, so that they, they, they're controlling the overall herd structure for future years. It's beginning to look at the future of, of, of the, the wildlife around them, again helping stay in one place by manipulating the resources of the environment. I, I, I suspect they're doing that because they invested so much in the site. Building these mud clay buildings is a huge task of labour, of resources, huge quantities of water being required. Having invested all that time in building here, they probably want to stay the longer periods doing any one year and keep coming back. The wild resources by themselves would not have allowed that to be sustained, so they had to start managing the environment by the cultivation, by weeding and watering and um, re re replanting wild barley, and by beginning to herd the animals in the way that Bill was describing. It shows a, a, suddenly a change of attitude to the landscape and the environment around them, which is a key element in the start of the whole neolithization process. We've got here a small range of the artefacts that have been recovered from WF16. So these all date to between 11 and 12,000 years ago. Uh, it is a pre-pottery neolithic site, so the vessels are being primarily made out of stone, sometimes out of wicker work and then covered with bitumen, and quite often they're decorated. You can see here you've got a beautiful wavy line there with these bosses underneath, mimicking what we find in the architecture of the large communal structure. And I find these particularly fascinating, these stone, these stone plaques with these various geometric uh, images on, wavy lines, straight lines. Um, no. Um, representation as far as we can see but I'm sure they're charged of symbolic symbolic meaning. What do you think about those Bill? Well, I think th th this one's particularly interesting where you've got the combination of the wavy line and the straight lines yeah. because that's a symbol that's found on various sites up and down the Jordan Valley and it looks like it's one of the things that connect, unites these people together re regionally. The artifact that's the, the, the classic one of the PPNA is this tiny little arrowhead with, it, with its two little notches on either side. And these, these are the typical things that we find on all the early PPNA sites, and it is, is if you like the, 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 the type, site, type find of these sites. They're called Elkheim Points. Elkheim Points after that, the first site they were found at. They weren't necessarily arrowheads. They might have been... No, a range we, of we, we've done some microscopic examination of the patterns of use that have been built up on them, and it looks like some of them are being used for drilling, so, so possibly, uh, indeed, for making these things because these are the stone beads made out of the local copper ore. That's why we get this green colour. And it's the first, in a sense, use of, the, of copper in, in, in the region that goes on to become so famous for copper mining. But they're just using the, the raw copper ore. And some of these things are really quite big, and you can see how they're made. You can actually see the drilled hole going down through them. And we had on the site one 
little building that seems to be in a workshop. And on the floor of that, if you remember, the, the, there was a flat stone with little indentations. So it was like a work uh, bench. Yeah. So you could actually put your stone in it to hold it like a vice and then drill drill out the centre of them. So that, that, that was a real workshop. They're working lots of other types of materials as well. We've got uh, many pieces of, 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 of bone which have either been clearly made into um, functional artefacts, such as this tiny, I'm not going to pick it up, this tiny little bone needle here. And that reminds us that we're only seeing a tiny fraction of the uh, materials they're working, because they must have been working um, hide, leather, wide range of plant materials, making different um, fabrics from them, none of which has, none of which has survived. Some of the bone objects, however, are decorated um, suggesting again they're full of uh, symbolic meaning. So this highly polished bit of uh, bit, bit of rib bone, um, polished and burnished, and then it's got these these tiny little drill um, uh, holes in, but clearly forming some form of uh, geometric pattern. The needle's very good because the fact that it's a proper needle with a hole in it for putting thread through shows that they're, they're working soft materials as well. Yeah. It's, it's this, this period, I think people forget, you know, the, the image of prehistory is people wearing old le thick leather hide and all the rest of it. This shows that they're, they're probably wearing quite, quite sophisticated materials. This is, this is actually one of my favorites, this little basalt cup. And what, what we don't know if it's a cup or it might even be a small uh, mortar for grinding uh, fi fine uh, things like pigments or even makeup perhaps or, 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 or scented materials. But that's a lovely worked piece of basalt that. Yeah. And, and most of the raw materials are local. So the malachite is coming from the surrounding geology as of this stone. But many of the shells, and they're using shells to make, make beads, uh, such as these tiny, beautiful little examples here. These would have been uh, coming from um, the coast, either both the Mediterranean coast and the Red Sea coast. Uh, now, whether they um, derive from people going and collecting them from here, or whether they arrived here by, by trade or as gifts from visitors, we don't know. But clearly, with all this vast array of material culture, it suggests that this is a bit of a melting pot for ideas about, um, about, uh, about craft skills and where there's a lot of innovation happening, especially, I think, on working the Malachite. So, 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 so exciting to see that. Uh.